Hello guys, welcome to a new chapter of the Empress Dowager CG. This is gonna be chapter 15. In retirement and in leisure. 1889-1894. Because the Summer Palace was still under construction when CG retired in 1889, she lived first in the Sea Palace, adjacent to the Forbidden City. There her adopted son had a villa, Yingtai, in the middle of the lake where he often stayed. Seeing her almost daily for the routine greetings, Wang Yu was totally silent about state business. He had long yearned to be in charge of his own affairs and wanted even less of Siji's interference after she imposed a detested marriage on him. Before her retirement, a set of rules, the statutes, had been drawn up by Prince Chun and the grandees concerning her future political role, which she had accepted. The statutes did not require Emperor Wang Xu to consult her over policy, nor did they give her any say over the Emperor's decisions, with the single exception of the appointment of senior officials, for which her approval had to be obtained before an announcement could be made. In addition, Emperor Wang Xu was obliged to send her the titles of the reports he received, from which she could get a vague idea of what was going on in the Empire, but no details. These copies were for information only, however much Prince Chun wanted CG to continue at the helm and however much she wanted to be, this was as far as they could go. When just before her retirement an official a petition for all reports that were destined for the Emperor to be presented to her as well, she had no alternative but to reject the idea out of hand. Emperor Wang Yu followed the statues to the letter, and the first list was sent to CG on the every day that he assumed the power. Simultaneously, her contacts with the Grand Council and other officials were severed, including with Earl Li. At first, it seems that the woman who had been at the center of historical action for nearly three decades found it hard to stay away. That summer, she stepped in and announced the launch of the Beijing-Wuhan Railway in a decree that said specifically, His Majesty, on the order of Her Majesty the Empress of Wagger Siji, she was able to do this probably because Grand Tutor Wang was away attending to his family tombs and the Emperor bowed to her forceful intervention. But when the tutor was back and disapproved of the project, Wang Xu shelved it. Early the following year, 1890, she seized the opportunity presented by a trip to pay homage at the Eastern Mausoleums, for which senior officials gathered, to meet with the Grand Council and Early. They discussed railway projects and the latest situation in Korea, a vassal state of China's, where a crisis involving rivalrous foreign powers was looming. The meeting created such bad odor with the Emperor that, it seems, he had it out with her, which in turn made Siji furious. When she handed out fruits as a goodwill gesture to officials, she excluded the Emperor's attendance. Similar moments of tensions continue into an 1891. Siji's formal move into the Summer Palace on the 4th of June 1891 put an end to this struggle, as she was now physically removed from the decision-making center. Any further effort would involve nothing sort of conspiracy. Emperor Wang Yu made a point of ma marking her departure with an imperial decree and an elaborate ceremony attended by a large contingent of officials. That morning he led them all in formal garb to kneel outside the gate of the Sea Palace to see her on her way. After he had a sedan chair set off, he went ahead in order to greet her, again on his knees upon her arrival at the Summer Palace. They had dinner together, after which he returned to the Forbidden City. Thereafter, he visited the Summer Palace regularly, but only to beat her good health. These shows of etiquette kept her firmly away from politics, as Siji later told a viceroy, After my retirement, I no longer had anything to do with state affairs. Her royal duties were symbolic and prescribed. When harvests failed on a large scale, she would issue a public announcement donating money from the court. When Prince Chun died in 1891, it was her responsibility to oversee all the requisite manner arrangements, from the interment to the construction of a temple dedicated to the prince. Otherwise, she would spend her days with eunuchs and ladies of the court. The person who looked after her and made sure things ran smoothly was her head eunuch, Li Lianjing, the man who had taken, been taken by Prince Chun on his tour to inspect the navy. The trip had been Siji's gift to the key figure in her daily life, as well as the prince's way of making amends to her. 
The American painter Catherine Carl, who met him some years later, described Liang Ying. In person, he's tall and thin. His head is in type like a Savonolas. He has a Roman nose, a massive lean jaw, a protruding lower lip and very short eyes, full of intelligence that shine out of sunken orbits. His face is much wrinkled and his skin like old parchment. He has elegant insinuating manners, speaks excellent Chinese, having a fine enunciation, a good choice of words and a low, pleasant voice. Lian Jing's future as a eunuch was sealed when he was six by his poverty-stricken father, who took the child to a professional castrator. When he first entered the court, the boy preferred play to work and was considered lazy. But strict training and severe punishments for their election changed him and made him assiduous in serving his masters and obeying court rules. Exceptionally cautious and sensitive, he looked after Siji to perfection. He was her taster and also her best friend. Siji was lonely, some of her eunuchs recalled. Although the Empress Dowager had many matters to deal with, it appeared that her life was rather empty. When she was not working, she painted and watched operas and so on, but she was often restless. The only person who could relieve her restlessness was the eunuch Li Lian Ying. He knew how to look after her and became her indispensable companion. We could see that they were very, very close. The eunuchs remembered that Siji often dropped into Lian Jing's room and called out, Lian Jing, let's go for a stroll. They will then walk together and we will follow them from a distance. The Empress the Wagger sometimes even called Li Lian Jing to her bedchamber, and they would chat deep into the night. When Lian Jing was ill, or pretended to be ill in order to stay in bed, according to the eunuchs, the Empress the Wagger would worry and would summon the court doctors at once. She would stay with him until he took the medicine which were herbs and other ingredients that took time to dole out, mix and brew. In the court medical records, Lian Jing had his own file, unique for a member of staff who shared files. This medical privilege was unavailable even to lower rank royal concubines. Xi Yi showered him with expensive gifts and promoted him to a high rank that was unprecedented for a eunuch in Qin history. In the court, Lian Jing's privileged position generated little malicious jealousy, as by consensus, he was always respectful to his superiors and always generous to his inferiors, both in the country at large because of his closeness to Siji and because he was a eunuch, officials were constantly accusing him of meddling in state affairs, although no one ever produced any proof. As a matter of fact, Siji never involved him in politics, following the Qin rules meticulously. Both the accusations refused to die down. When he was taken on the Navy inspection tour by Prince Chun, the news generated such a tempest that it almost overshadowed the inspection itself. One censor wrote to reprimand Siji, alleging that sending Liang Jing on the trip had caused floods that had ruined the crops in several provinces. Siji broke her own rule of not punishing critics and accused the censor of slander, on which basis she publicly and emphatically rejected his petitions threw them back at him, and demoted the hapless man. When another official wrote to say that eunuch should not let, be let out of the capital at all, she ignored the petition. Still, there was widespread gossip that the engine had attained this privileged position through his exceptional skill in dressing Siji's hair. A baseless rumor that was charged with sexual innuendo. Even a later, defeated by Japan during Siji's retirement, was blamed on her relationship with Lian Jing. Lian Jing would get even in his own way, often offered expensive gifts by officials, hoping for a sinecure, he would accept them but then do nothing. Siji was well aware this was happening and acquiesced. Trying all sorts of ways to reward Lian Jing, Siji invited his sister to stay in the court, but her stay was short. As the relative of a eunuch, she was in an awkward position. When other ladies rode in stand chairs, tired after long w a long walk, she had to trot, like her brother, alongside the chairs, which was excruciating for her bound feet. A palace mate observed that the Empress Dowager would have allowed her a sedan chair for herself, but the prudent Lian Jing would never have accepted the favor. His sister's station was considered so low that the servants would not even take tips from her. We wouldn't accept her tips even if we were dying of poverty, one of the maids snorted. Before long, the sisters stopped appearing at court. 
The court ladies around Siji were mostly young widows. They had all had their marriages arranged by the Empress of Wager, which was considered the greatest of privileges, and all were prohibited by the traditional code of honor from marrying again after their husbands had died. Among them was a daughter of Prince Ching, Si Ye Ye, who was clever and vivacious, fun-loving and popular, and who made Siji love. Siji said the girl reminded her of her younger self and missed her whenever she was away. Another teenage widow was a Lady Yuan, who was not actually married in the normal sense. The man to whom she had been engaged, a nephew of Siji, had died before the wedding, but before the funeral, Lady Yuan dressed herself in a widow's garb and in a sedan chair draped with white sackcloth, a sign of mourning, went to his coffin and performed the ritual that established her position as his widow. This highly regarded act of spousal loyalty set her on a lifetime of castity and loneliness. To an observer, she was wooden and lifeless, and Siji did not have much to say to her, but she took pity on Lady Yuan and always included her in the invitations. Empress Longyu was a perennial fixture on Siji's retinue. The Emperor completely ignored her, even when they bumped into each other and she went down on her knees to greet him. People regarded her as sweet, charming and lovable, but there is sometimes a look in her eyes of patient resignation that is almost pathetic. Her life was empty and she was very bored. Some said she took out her frustration and bitterness on servants and pets, and that her cats always ran away after a few months. All the ladies would try to be cheerful when they were around CG, but there was little real happiness. CG led a well-ordered life. In the morning she took her time getting up, no longer forcing herself to rise at 5 or 6, but lingering sometimes until after 8. When she was ready for the day, signaled by the windows in her quarters being open, the whole palace began to buzz. Eunuch messengers raced around to announce the news, and chief eunuchs congregated outside her apartment to await instructions. In her room, she put on a silk dressing gown, while a maid rushed to the kitchen to fetch hot water, which was poured into a silver bowl, held aloft by a junior eunuch on his knees, with maids standing holding soap dishes and hand towels. Siji attended to her face by covering it with a hot towel for a few minutes before patting it dry. Then she wrapped her hands in another towel and soaked them in the hot water for a rather long time, long enough for the water to be changed two or three times, which was said to be her secret for keeping her hands soft like a young girl's. After rinsing her teeth, she sat on a chair facing south and a eunuch came in to dress her hair. According to the eunuchs, CJ had begun to lose hair at the age of 40, and a jet black toupee was placed over the thin patch. It required considerable skill to keep the wig in position while combing her hair and fixing it in the complicated Manchu style, with jeweled pins. Her hairdresser would also supply her with the gossip of the previous day, and she would slowly take her daily jelly, jelly of silver fungus, Ginev which was supposed to be good for one's health and looks. When the hairdressing was over, she placed ornaments in her hair. No Manchu lady's kofur was considered complete without flowers, and Siji preferred flesh, fresh flowers to jewels. She would definitely make flower arrangements on her hair, sometimes weaving the snowy blooms of jasmine into a diadem. Her palace mates also wore flowers in their hair, and when they stood beside her, those on her right would have flowers on the right side, and those on her left, their left. There was not much she could do to her face. As a widow, she was not supposed to wear makeup. Otherwise, Manchu ladies painted their faces excessively white and pink, and had a vivid patch of red on their lower lips, to produce a cherry-like small mouth, considered beautiful in those days when white lips were deemed ugly. Longing to use a little makeup, Siji would discreetly apply a touch of rouge on her cheeks and on the center of her palms, and even a little on her lips. The rouge used in the court was made with roses that grew in the hills west of Beijing. The petals of a certain red rose were put in a stone mortar and crushed with a white marble pestle. A little alum was added, and the dark red liquid thus produced was poured into a rouge go jug through fine white gauze. Silk wool was cut into small square or round pads and placed in the jug for days to soak up the liquid. The silk pads were then drained inside the room with a glass window to avoid catching dust, 
before ending up on the royal dressing table. See so you will dab the pad with lukewarm water before applying it. For her lips she would roll up a pad or twist one around a jade hairpin to form a kind of lipstick and dab the rouge in the center of her lips, more on the lower lip than the upper. For perfume she mixed the oils of different flowers herself. Apparently the palace also made its own soap under Sigi's direction. The maids will show her the paste that would eventually solidify into soap and she will vigorously stir it herself. As a widow, Sigi could not wear brilliant colors like bright reds or greens, but even clothes that were considered discreet were colorful by European standards. Around the house she might put on a pale orange robe with a pale blue waistcoat embroidered along the hems. And for a special occasion, one of her favorite outfits was a blue brocade robe embroidered uh, with big white magnolias. Catherine Carr, the American painter who spent 11 months with her, observed. She is always immaculately neat. She designs her own dresses, has excellent taste in the choice of colors, and I never saw her with an unbecoming color on, except the imperial yellow. This was not becoming, but she was obliged to wear it in all official occasions. She used to modify it as much as possible by the trimmings, and would sometimes have it so heavily embroidered that the original color was hardly visible. Sigi's jewels were often set to her own designs, among which was a pearl mantle that she would wear an, as an official jacket. Diamonds were an acquired taste. The Chinese of her time considered their brilliance to be vulgar and mostly used them as drill tips. Dressing up was important to Sigi. She would examine herself at length in the mirror, sometimes for longer than it seemed fitting, given her age, or so thought some of her mates and ladies in waiting. Sigi guessed what was in the young woman's minds and one day told the lady in waiting, their link, who recorded their exchange. It must seem to you quite funny to see an old lady like me taking so much care and pains in dressing and fixing up. Well, I like to dress myself up and to see pretty young girls dress nicely. It makes you want to be young again yourself. I told her that she looked quite young and was still beautiful and that although we were young we would never dare compare ourselves to her. This pleased her very much as she was very fond of compliments. Before she left her dressing room, Sigi would stand and take a last look at her shoes, which had a comfortable square cut toe, quite unlike the sharply pointed ones worn by Han women. Her socks were made of white silk and were tied at the ankle with a pretty ribbon, and she would look to see if the edges at the socks showing above the shoes were as they should be. Each pair was only worn once, so a constant supply was needed. Apart from a, a team of seamstresses, her family and other aristocratic households also made socks for her and presented them as gifts. Her morning toilet completed, she just started going towards the door of the outer hall with her erect carriage and light swift walk. A maid parted the curtains and at this moment for which the eunuch chiefs outside had been waiting, their eyes fixed on the drapes, all dropped to their knees and cried out, Old Buddha, Lao Foye, all joy be with you. She had adopted this nickname for herself, which, both illustrious and informal, was how she was addressed now in the court and was popularly known in Beijing. While giving the eunuch chiefs their instructions for the day, Siji took her first smoke from a water pipe, which had an elongated stem and a small rectangular box to be held in the palm. Most of the time she did not hold her own pipe, this was the job of a pipe maid, standing about two paving bricks distance away from the Empress Dowager. According to one of them, when Sigi glanced at her, the pipe maid's right hand that held the pipe would gently extend its tip to within an inch of the corner of Sigi's mouth, whereupon, with a slight turn of the neck, the firm lips would part to take it. The pipe remained in the hands of the maid while Sigi puffed on it. For this service, the maids had been trained for many months, until their right palms could hold a cup of hot water for a long enough time without twitching. After two pipes of tobacco, breakfast was uh, served. First came her tea. The Manchus drank tea with a lot of milk. In her case, the milk came from the breast of a nurse. 
Sigi had been taking human milk since her prolonged illness in the early 1880s, on the recommendation of a renowned doctor. Several wet nurses were employed and took turns to squeeze milk into a bowl for her. The nurses brought their sucking babies with them and the woman who served her the longest stayed on in the palace, her son being given education and an office job. While she sipped her tea, a team of eunuchs carried over her food in lacquered boxes, wrapped in yellow silk with a dragon motif. Lian Jing, the head eunuch, took the boxes at the door and brought them himself to Siji. She ate sitting cross-legged on a kang, a long rectangular brick structure the height of a bed which could be heated from underneath and was used all over North China as a bed or a seat. She liked to be seated by a window so that she could look out on the courtyard and, and enjoy the light of the sky. Her foot was placed on a low table on the kang and extended to some small tables that would be folded away when the meal was finished. When the food boxes were properly arranged, they were open in front of Siji's eyes, as court rules dictated. They contained a large variety of porridges, rolls and cakes, steamed, baked and fried, and many kinds of drinks ranging from soya bean juice to beef bone consomme. There were also plenty of savory side dishes, such as dog's liver cooked in soya and other spicy sauces. The Empress Dowager had a hearty appetite and would go on to have another two sizable meals and small snacks. The meals were taken whenever she happened to be. She had no fixed dining room. The scale and presentation of the meals followed court stipulations. They would only be reduced if there was a national disaster. As the Empress Dowager, Siji was entitled to a daily allocation of 31 kilos of pork, one chicken and one duck. With this, as well as vegetables and other ingredients, the quantities of which were all specified, dozens of dishes were cooked and for a main meal will be set out in more than a hundred plates of bowls. Most of the dishes were never touched and were only there to amplify the presentation. She is seldom drank with her meals and mostly ate on her own, as anyone invited to join her had to do standing, except the Emperor. Often court ladies in attendance would be asked to eat at her table after she had finished and left, in which case they were permitted to sit down. Usually dishes from her table would be given to courtiers as tokens of imperial favor. The emperor would also receive her dishes if he was staying in the same palace complex. The vast quantities of leftover food from the court enabled a string of food stalls in the neighborhood to do a brisk business, and at certain times each day, rag beggars were allowed to come to a particular gate to receive the remnants and shift through their rubbish before it was carted away. Lunch was followed by a careful hand washing, and then a siesta. Before she dozed off, Siji would read the classics with her eunuch instructors, who would enliven the text by weaving in jokes that amused Siji. When she got up, there was another tremor in the palace. As an eyewitness described, when Her Majesty awakes, the news flashes like an electric spark through all the precincts and over the whole enclosure and everyone is on the quiet vivi in a moment. Before she went to bed at around 11 pm, she often enjoyed a food massage. To Jesus first saw her feet in a silver-plated wooden bowl with white rolled back arms serving as food rests. The water in the bowl was boiled with flowers or herbs as prescribed by her physicians, bearing in mind factors such as the climate and her physical condition. In summer it might be dried chrysanthemum and in winter it will be flowering kins. The machesus pressed the various pressure points, especially on the soles, rather like a reflexology session today. If her toenails needed cutting, the master shoes would gently request permission to use scissors, which the chief mate then brought in. Sharp objects were normally forbidden in CG's quarters. A manicure meant tending to her long fingernails, which were extraordinarily long on the fourth and fifth fingers, as was common among aristocratic Manchu women. The exceptionally long nails were protected by shields made of open work cloisonne or gold, set with rubies and pearls. As no lady of position would dress herself or comb her own hair, such nails did not present an insurmountable problem. Her bed was a kank built into an alcove in the room, 
with shelves around the three enclosing sides on which were placed ornaments such as small jade figures. Her bedside reading amounted to another session of studying the classics with her eunuch instructors which sent her to sleep. As she slept, a maid sat on the floor of the room as noiselessly as a piece of furniture. More maids and eunuchs were in the antechamber outside the apartment and elsewhere in the building. The night shifts would all hear the snoring of a sound sleeper. Siju was now in her early 50s and in very good health. She played the game of kick shuttlecock with more agility than her more younger entourages and climbed hills fast, without any sign of fatigue. In Beijing's biting winter, she would normally decline heating, preferring nothing in her bedroom and only charcoal burning or copper brassiers in the large halls. Picturesque though these were, they produced little more than curling blue flames and made little difference to the temperature. The doors of her apartment were left open and draped with padded curtains, which were constantly lifted for the passage of eunuchs and maids, so blasts of cold air swept in at every entry or exit. Everyone else felt frozen to the bone, and yet Siji seemed impervious. She just wore silk wool undergarments and a fur coat, at most with a big fur cloak on top. Her mind was as sharp as ever, and so it was difficult for her to shut herself off completely from politics. What made it possible for her to endure the enforced isolation and leisure, day in and day out, was her wide range of interests. She was curious about all new things and wanted to try everything. Having added a couple of steamboats to the lake, she asked to be flown in a hot air balloon which had been brought some years earlier for military use. Both early gave her by a Prince Ching as the air was no longer permitted to communicate directly with her, the disappointing news that the balloon was no longer in a fit condition and might explode. The Summer Palace was a source of endless pleasure for CG, and she never tired of walking in its grounds. Strolling in the rain appealed to her the most. The eunuchs always brought an umbrella, but she would only use it in heavy downpours. A large retinue of eunuchs followed her, together with ladies-in-waiting and palace maids, bearing her clothes, shoes, handkerchiefs, combs, brushes, powder boxes, looking glasses of different sizes, perfumes, pins, black and red ink, yellow paper, cigarettes, water pipes, and the last one carried her yellow satin-covered stool. Like a lady's dressing room on legs, according to one lady-in-waiting. Often Siji and her ladies were carried in sedan chairs to a picturesque spot of her choosing, where she would sit on her yellow satin stool, gazing for a long time into the distance. One scenic stop was the top of a high arch bridge, which undulated in a soft, flowing way and was suitably named the Jade Shas. Another place she liked was a cottage built and furnished entirely of bamboo, where she often had tea. Her teas were the finest, with the first leaves from all over the empire, which she drank from a jade cup into which she would drop a few dried petals of honeysuckle, jasmine or rose. The dried blossoms were brought to her in a jade bowl with two slender cherry wood sticks, which she used to pick up the blossoms, drop them into her cup and stir the tea. A favorite activity was boating on the lake, during which her barge was sometimes followed at a distance by eunuch musicians, playing the bamboo flute or bamboo recorder or the Yue King, a moon-shaped instrument like the mandolin. All would be silent when CG listened, as if entranced. Sometimes in moonlight, she would sing softly to the music floating over the water. Nature was her passion and she adored plants. Chrysanthemums were among her best loved flowers. During the season for propagation, CG would lead the court ladies in taking cuttings and setting them out in flower pots, watering them religiously until they began to bud. The pots were then covered with mats so that they would not be damaged by heavy rain. For this, she would even forgo her usual nap. Later on, when she returned to power, she broke with the old custom of allowing no plants in palaces of official duties and filled the audience hall with a profusion of potted flowers, arranging them in tiers. Officials coming for their audiences had to orient themselves before they went down on their knees as her throne seemed to be hidden behind a flower mountain. 
she was devoted to her orchard, from which large baskets of fruits would be brought before her daily when they were in season. She would inspect their color and shape and would hold up a cluster of grapes against the light for a long time. Apples, pears and peaches filled the huge porcelain pots in the halls for their subtle fragrance. When the fragrance was gone, the fruits were divided amongst the servants. The scentless gourd also commanded her affection, and she would often stroke them on their trellises, sometimes in torrential rain. Her collection of gourd ran to several hundred, which an artistic eunuch sculpted into musical instruments, dinner sets, and a variety of fanciful articles, adding miniature paintings and calligraphy to their surface. Siji prepared some of the gourds to be carved by using a sharpened piece of bamboo to scrape off the outer skin. Every few days she would visit her large vegetable gardens and would be delighted if she could take away some fresh vegetables or other farm produce. Occasionally she cooked them herself in one of the courtyards and once she taught her ladies-in-waiting how to boil eggs with black tea leaves and spices. Mosquitoes could be a nuisance in the summer palace, especially in summer evenings, but Siege's Inuks devised an ingenious solution. They erected giant marquees, each big enough to enclose a building and its courtyards completely, roofed and curtained with reed matting and a system of ropes and pulleys that rolled and unrolled the top and hoisted and lowered the curtains. These works of art serve as vast mosquito nets, in addition to shielding the large enclosures from the sun during the day. With lanterns hanging discreetly and candles flickering in the breeze, evenings were a scented pleasure, scarcely troubled by insects. The same mar marquees were erected for the foreign legations. CG loved birds and animals. She learned how to rear and breed them and engaged a eunuch who was a great expert to teach her. Birds in his care were not always confined, although there were hundreds of cages hanging in rows of bamboo frames in one of the large courtyards. Some flew freely, having made their home in the summer palace. To protect this rare species, young men with knowledge of birds were recruited into the Praetorian Guard to patrol the grounds with crossbows, ready to shoot down any natural predators or unwanted wild birds that had the temerity to gate crash. The demand for foods for Siege's birds created a flourishing trade outside the summer palace, selling all sorts of caterpillars, grasshoppers, crickets and ant nests, nests, each set to benefit a different avian attribute. Some birds were trained to fly towards a high-pitched trail in order to receive their favorite foods. Wherever Siji was, whether climbing a hill or boating in the lake, eunuchs near her would sound the trail so that the birds would fly around her. Siji herself was skilled at imitating bird song and could entice birds to her outstretched fingertips. Her bird taming ability later mesmerized Western visitors. One, her American portrait, Catherine Carl, wrote. She had a long, one-like stick, which had been cut from a sapling and freshly stripped of its bark. She loved the faint forest odor of these freshly cut sticks. And she held the one she carried aloft and made a loud, bird-like sound with her lips, never taking her eyes off the bird. He fluttered and began to descend from bow to bow until he lighted upon the crook of her one, when she gently moved her other hand up nearer and nearer until it finally rested on her finger. Miss Carr was watching with breathless attention and so tense and absorbed had I become that the sudden cessation, when the bird finally came upon her finger, caused me a thump of almost pain. Even fish were induced to jump onto her open palms, to her own chat like shrieks. It took buckets of a special kind of earthworm, red and about 3 cm long, to entice the fish to leap up towards a human hand at a quay where CG often disembarked for lunch. She bred dozens of dogs. They lived in a pavilion furnished with silk cushions to sleep on a large wardrobe of jackets, in brocades embroidered with chrysanthemums, crab apple blossoms and other gorgeous patterns. To avoid undesirable couplings, only her dogs were allowed in the palace grounds. The hundreds of pet dogs belonging to the court ladies and eunuchs had to be kept in their own courtyards. Some dog breeders consider that Siji did more for the peckiness than any other fancier since the origin of the breed. One type of peckiness whose breeding she discontinued was the sleeve dog, 
a miniature that would, could be carried in the courtier sample sleeves that were used as pockets. The growth of the sleeve dogs was said to be stunted by feeding them only on sweets and wine and making them wear tight-fitting wire mesh waistcoats. CG told Catherine Carr that she detested such unnatural methods and that she could not understand why animals should be the form for man's pleasure. The pets she was particularly fond of were a pecking spock and a sky terrier. The latter could perform tricks and would lie completely still at Sage's command, moving only when she told him to, no matter how many others spoke to him. The pecking spock had long and silky, fawn-colored hair and large, pale brown liquid eyes. He was not easily taught and was affectionately called Little Fool, Shasi by CG. Later, she had their portraits painted by Catherine Carl, sitting behind the painter herself and taking the liveliest interest. In Beijing, there was a large collection of birds and animals, built up by the French missionary zoologist and botanist Armand David, who since coming to China in the early years of Siege's reign, had identified many hundreds of new species unknown in Europe, among them the giant panda. When Siji heard about the collection, she was intrigued and eager to see it. It so happened that the collection was attached to a Catholic cathedral, which overlooked the Sea Palace. After negotiations with the Vatican, through an English intermediary, her government paid 400,000 tiles for another cathedral to be built elsewhere, and bought the old church along with the collection. Siji visited it, but only once. She had scant interest in the dead creatures. The only competitive games that tradition permitted her were parlor games. CG did not enjoy cards or mahjong, which she refused to allow at court. Dice throwing was a popular pastime, and CG occasionally played. She invented a dice game not unlike snakes and ladders, except that the board was a map of the Chinese Empire, with all the provinces marking different colors. Eight carved ivory deities represented the legendary eight Taoist immortals, traveled around the empire attempting to reach the capital. In the process, they might be diverted to beauty spots like Hangzhou or sent into exile, in which case they would have to be dropped out, all depending on the throw of the dice. The one who reached Beijing first was the winner and would receive sweets and cakes, while the losers had to sing a song or tell a joke. Gambling was not involved, in fact it was officially banned, with offenders being fined and caned. Painting was a serious hobby for which Shiji engaged a Lady Miao, a young widow to be her teacher. Lady Miao was Han and was conspicuous in the court for her hair that reached her toes. Instead of, her, of the complicated and much decorated Manchu headdresses, she combed her hair into a neat coil on the back of her head and encircled the coil with strings of pearls. Rather than a full-length Manchu robe, she wore a loose upper garment that came down to just below her knees, over a long plaited skirt which revealed a pair of three-inch golden lilies, bound feet on which she tethered and swayed along in agony. Siji, who as a Manchu had escaped foot binding, would cringe at the sight of the deformed feet. Once before, when she had set ties on the bare feet of one of the nurses who provided milk for her, she had said that she could not bear to see them and had to have them unbound. Now she asked Lady Miao to unbind her feet and ordered that the painting teacher was only too happy to obey. Under Lady Miao's tutorship, Siji became a proficient amateur painter, wielding her brush with power and precision according to her teacher. She achieved something much valued in calligraphy, to write in just one brush stroke a giant character that was as big as a human figure. These characters denoting longevity and happiness were ritually given to top officials as gifts. Lady Miao's reputation as the Empress Dowager Tutor enabled her to sell her own paintings for high prices and to buy a large house and support her family. Near the Summer Palace were many Buddhist and Taoist temples, which organized regular festivals which women if chaperone, could attend dressed in the most gorgeous colors. Folk artists from far and wide came, walking on stilts and bouncing in lion dances, waving dragon lanterns and performing acrobatic and magic tricks. As they passed by the Summer Palace, CG often watched from a tower above the walls. Knowing the Empress Dowager was there, the performers would show off their skills, 
and she will cheer and give generous tips. One bearded man who gyrated in the disguise of a village woman was for a while the recipient of the largest rewards. Seiji was a great fan of popular entertainments and never regarded them as beneath her. It was in this spirit that she helped turn the genre of Peking opera into the national opera of China. This genre had traditionally been for the average folk of the alleys and villages, as its stories, music and humor were easy to follow and enjoy. Considered vulgar, it had been shown by the court, where only orthodox opera, with its restricted tunes and storylines, was staged. Siji's husband, Emperor Xianfen, began to patronize Peking opera, but it fell to Siji to mold it into a sophisticated art form while retaining in its playfulness. She extended royal approval by bringing in artists from outside the court to perform for her and to instruct the eunuchs in the music department. She demanded professionalism. Historically, Peking opera was rather casual, with unpunctual opening times, slapdash makeup and costumes. Actors would often hail friends from the stage or make impromptu jokes. Siji addressed all these details with a series of specific orders. She made punctuality mandatory, threatening to cane repeated offenders. On one occasion, a principal actor, Tan Xian Pei, was late, and she, being a huge fan and feeling unable to have him cane, made him play a clownish pig in The Monkey King. Professional acting was handsomely rewarded. While previous emperors tipped the leading players one tile of silver age at most, Siji habitually lavished dozens of tiles on them, as much as 60 to a lead actor, for instance, to Tan, who was also given presents as part of the dowry for his daughter's wedding. In comparison, the chief of the music department at the court earned about seven tiles a month. In one year, her tips to all involved in the opera shows total 33,000 tiles. Being so well treated, Peking opera actors became celebrities, like the film stars of a later age. The public could see how prestigious they were. In one case, 218 artists traveled in the royal procession from the Summer Palace to the Forbidden City, all on horseback, with 12 carts carrying their costumes and paraphernalia. A career in the opera became hardly sought after. Siege's opera houses were constructed with carefully designed artistry. In the Sea Palace, a pavilion-style theater was built in the middle of the lake, where there were lotuses all around so that summer shows took place among their blooms. In the Forbidden City, a heated glass conservatory was erected as a cozy warm theater in the midst of winds and snows. In the Summer Palace, she restored a two-story theater in an arena that attracted the Orioles. Their call was set to go well with the Arias. Then she built another, more magnificent three-story opera house with a stage 21 meters high, 17 meters wide and 16 meters deep, and a backstage large enough to hold complicated sets. This was the grandest theater in China. Both the ceiling and the floors could be opened during the performance to allow gods to descend from heaven and the Buddha to rise from the depths of the earth, sitting on an enormous lotus flower. Snowflakes, white confetti, could shower from the sky, and water could spout upwards from the mouth of a giant turtle. A pool of water under the stage enhanced the acoustics. The theater was situated next to a bus lake so that the melody could travel unimpended over its surface. The Peking Opera repertoire was enormously expanded under Siji. She revived a number of obsolete dramatic pieces by having their liberty docked from the court archives and adapted to the tunes of Peking Opera. In the process of adaptation and trying to accommodate Siji's own lines, one actor composer, Wang Yao King, enlarged the opera's musical range. With Siji's rewards and encouragement, the actor composer revolutionized Peking Opera by giving female characters played by men including him, proper acting roles. They had traditionally been confined to minor parts and could only sing stiffly, not act. Now, for the first time, Peking Opera had lead female roles. In this undertaking, CG became intimately involved in the writing of a 105-episode work, The Warriors of the Yang Family, about a 10th to 11th century family who took up arms defending China against invaders. In recorded history, the warriors were all men, but in folk legends the women of the family were the heroes, and this was reflected in a script in Kung Pu, a disappearing drama form. 
Siji knew the story and took it upon herself to make it a part of the Peking Opera repertoire. She summoned the literary men of the court, mainly doctors and painters, and read out to them her translation of the Kung Ku script. The men were divided into groups, each being given some episodes to write for Peking Opera, supervising them was a woman, a widow and a poetess, who had been sought out by Siji at the same time as Lady Miao. Siji herself remained the chief editor of the whole drama. Since then, episodes of the female warriors of the young family have become some of the most performed and best loved Peking Opera numbers, and have been much adapted into other art forms. The names of the female warriors have entered everyday language as synonyms for brave and bright women who outshine men. Siji detested age-old prejudices against women. During one opera performance, when a singer sang the oft-repeated line, the most vicious of all is the heart of a woman, she flew into a rage and ordered the singer off the stage. Her rejection of the traditional attitude was undoubtedly shaped by her own experience. No matter how successful her rule on behalf of her son, an adopted son, she would always be denied the mandate to rule in her own right. Once the boy entered adulthood, she was obliged to give way and could no longer participate in politics. She could not even voice her own opinions. Watching Emperor Wang Zhu's shelving the modernization project she had initiated, Siji could not fail to despair, and yet there was nothing she could do. Any attempt at changing the status quo would have to involve violent and extreme means, such as launching a palace coup, which she was not prepared to contemplate. Only one woman in Chinese history, Wu Setian, had declared herself emperor and run the country as such. But she had had to do so in the face of mighty opposition, which she had quelled using higher, risingly cruel means. On the long list of alleged bloody murders was that of her own son, the Crown Prince. Siju was a different character and preferred to rule through consensus, winning over the opposition rather than killing them. As a result, she chose to observe the conditions of her retirement, but clearly she admired the female emperor and would have liked to stake a similar claim, if the costs were not so high. Her feelings were known to Lady Miao, her painting teacher. The painter once presented her with a scroll that depicted Wu Setian conducting state affairs as a legitimate sovereign. Siji's acceptance of the paintings say much about her aspirations and frustrations.